right through there. If you love them, if you love them, if you love them, if you love them, only if you love them, only if you love them, and only if you know he loves you. That means everybody ought to be clapping. I said that means everybody ought to be clapping. He loves you with an everlasting love, a love that never fails, a love that never gives up, a love that never runs out. He's a well of water that never runs dry. I love him because he first loved me. My soul loves him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we certainly thank God for his love. Father, we thank you for this time now. It is indeed preaching time. I pray, oh God, that you would allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. Lord, indeed, you are my strength. You are my strength. You are my strength. And you are my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people said amen. Hallelujah. We certainly give honor to God for his spirit and his presence. And we thank God for our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Melvin O. Mariner, and his lovely wife, Captain Shelley K. Mariner. We thank God for both of them. I am so grateful that he is my spiritual father and I'm grateful to be a son of this ministry. And I thank you all for your support and your patience through these last couple of weeks. I thank God for you. And I believe that God has me exactly where he wants me to be and I'm grateful to be here, hallelujah. I thank God for my wife, Doris. We thank God for her, hallelujah. And I try not to leave my mother out as well. So wave your hands so people can know who you are. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank God. But there is a word from the Lord. Amen. So if you could stand on your feet with me, pull out your smartphones or your Bibles, and we're going to be in Psalm, the first Psalm, and we're going to start at the first stanza. I'm going to start by reading the message version. And when you have it, you can signify by saying, I have the bread. That's not everybody, so let's see. Some of y'all are just dependent on the screen up there. I know what you're doing. But you ought to bring your Bibles to church. Amen? Amen. Psalm 1, 1 through 6. It reads like this. How well God must like you, you don't walk in the ruts of those blind as bats. You don't stand with the good for nothings. You don't take your seat among the know-it-alls. Instead, you thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night. You're a tree replanted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're not all at all like the wicked, who are mere windblown dust, without defense in court, unfit company for innocent people. Uh, New King James Version says it like this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted. Somebody say planted planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. If we could put a topic on this text, it would be, I'm living my best life. You may be seated in this presence. I'm living my best life. Hmm. This phrase is one that has taken a life of its own over the last several years. It is one that describes an individual that is being the best version of themselves, uh, living life to its fullest and putting one's superior qualities on display. And while there are many desires and dreams that come naturally to every human being, the more mature you become in Christ, you realize um, that the world's definition of your best life might not align with what God has planned for your life. 
Uh, while the world's definition of a best life is driven by culture, uh, money, and by the acquisition of tangible things, the believer lives his or her best life through spiritual growth and development. Can I get a witness in here? And as you grow in Christ, you realize that some of the things that you used, that used to define you don't seem to have the same amount of value anymore. Uh, the people that you used to associate with don't seem to be the proper fit any longer. And some of the things that used to bring you joy don't seem to hold as much weight as they used to. And the reason why is because your perspective has changed and the way in which you measure your life and the success of your life has has now shifted. Now, for the last several weeks, as you know, God has been de really dealing with me about the topic of obedience and how imperative it is for us as his children to be dedicated to a life of following his direction. Uh, we've talked about how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were obedient and committed to only worshiping God, uh, only worshiping his God, their God, by refusing to bow to King Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And then last week at eight o'clock, I preached about how uh, God was requiring King Saul to kill some things in his life that were not conducive to achieving his destined path. And so I believe, therefore, that in this season, God is looking for people who are willing to be obedient to him in season, hear me, and out of season, when it's hard and when it's easy, when it's popular and when it's not. And despite of how culture and society may make you feel like it's out of style, like it's old fashioned or antiquated, can I tell you that righteousness is always in order? I'll say it again. Righteousness is always in order. And whether you realize it or not, my brothers and my sisters, obedience will yield a blessing in your life. It might not come right away. It might not come uh, instantly. You might not receive the results. And it seems like that the wicked may prosper while you always end up doing the right thing and get the shorthand of the stick. But I came to tell you that God will honor your commitment to his will and obedience to his word. He will take care of his own. I said, God will take care of his own. And as a matter of fact, let me take a moment and speak prophetically over you this morning. For all of you that feel like you've been doing the right thing and being obedient to God and it has got you nowhere, the Spirit of God told me to remind you this morning that your labor has not been in vain. You ought to lift your hands and receive it this morning. Your obedience to him has not been overlooked. And for every time they treated you poorly and you chose to be the bigger person, God said he he will repay you. For every time you wanted to do what was wrong and still chose to do what was right, God said, I will repay you. You ought to receive it this morning. For every time you got convicted and had to apologize, even when you felt like you did nothing wrong and it seems like everyone else can get away with everything, God said, I will repay you. He saw every act of obedience and you will be rewarded. For all the times you made a decision for God that caused you to be mocked and ridiculed. What you don't realize is that every act of obedience has been like a seed in the ground for you. And God is about to reward your faithfulness. You don't believe me? I got Bible to back it up. That's why the scripture says, be not weary in your well-doing. For in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Look at somebody and say, I've got seed in the ground. I, I've got seed in the ground. Every time you said yes to God, it was like seed in the ground. Every time you obeyed his commandment, it was a seed in the ground. Every time you wanted to cuss that joker out and you decided to pray for them and say it was a seed in the ground. And God told me to tell you that any day now, I just believe that payday is coming for you after a while. Look at somebody and say, do season. Due season, due season, God will always reward your faithfulness. And don't get me wrong, y'all sit down, you make me nervous. Don't get me wrong. When, I, when, when I'm talking about living righteously, I'm not talking about being perfect because perfection for you and I will never happen as long as we are here on this earth. Therefore, perfection is not the requirement. Watch this, but faithfulness is. Yeah. 
I can't get any help in here. I said perfection is not the requirement, but faithfulness is. That's why when it's all said and done and the rubber meets the road and you stand before the Father, he's not going to say, well done, good and perfect servant. He's going to say, well done, my good and, oh, I got some Bible readers, faithful servant. And I know there's about 30 people in the room that say, I haven't dotted every I, nor have I crossed every T. I haven't been perfect, but God knows I've been faithful. Faithful. I might have made some mistakes, but I didn't stay there. I might have tripped and fell a couple of times, but by the grace of God, I got back up. I got back here, and I tried again. God will honor your faithfulness. God will honor your faithfulness. God will honor your faithfulness. Y'all not going to push me to preach too early. In our text today... That's all the writer is saying. If you and I want to live our best lives, <laughs> you've got to be obedient to God. Here it is. If you want to live your best life, the text doesn't waste any time here. It says blessed or favored, some versions might say, is the man. That's gender neutral, man or woman, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, herein is our first direction we've been given. If you want to live your best life, you have to be careful of the people you allow in your circle. Y'all not talking to me like I want you to. If you want to live your best life, you have to be careful of the people you surround yourself with. The people that are whispering in your ear and the people you allow to influence you and the people that you seek counsel from and advice from. Those people impact your destiny. One of the things you'll notice when it comes to our Christian journey is that we have what's called a relational faith, meaning is that it is one filled with and dependent upon the power of relational equity. God uses community and personal relationship as a means to bring about spiritual growth and development in your life. So I came to tell you that it matters who you are connected to. I'm going to talk to the balcony because they're not talking to me. It matters who you are connected to. Tanisha, it matters who you are connected to. Lee, it matters who you are connected to. The people that you are connected to determine the very course of your life. Hear me. The people you are connected to determine the quality of your life. Watch this. And the people you are connected to determine the outcome of your life. Notice this. The wording that's in the text. It says, bless is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Then it says, who, who stands in the path of sinners. And then who doesn't sit in the path of scoffers. So notice the text. The person goes from walking. I'm moving in a certain direction. To now I'm standing, not moving anywhere. And third, now I'm sitting. I've gotten relaxed in my foolishness. Oh, y'all not... Y'all not trying to talk to me. And this, my friends, is a perfect example of how sin and unrighteousness and foolishness can be used to distract you from what God has planned for your life. <laughs> if you have found yourself in a season where your progress has been hindered and you felt like you were once moving forward and now you're stuck, the first thing you need to do is check the people in your circle. The first thing you need to do is check who you've allowed to influence your life. And I know we love to use the excuse that Jesus was always amongst sinners and he was the one who loved to be and sit and fellowship amongst the ones who had alternative lives and he was in the trenches and he didn't mind getting dirty. But let me give you a news flash. You are not Jesus. You are not Jesus. I am not Jesus. He was fully God and fully man. He was tempted in all manner of ways, but he was able to resist temptation. The only reason he was around them to be a light and a dark to a dark and dying people. He was amongst them to influence them. But your issue is you're being influenced by them instead of being an influence on them. And as a child of God, you got to be careful who you're around because when you walk 
walk into a room of people or hang out with a group of people, you should always be a thermostat instead of a thermometer. Because a thermometer changes with the atmosphere, but a thermostat is the one who sets the atmosphere. <laughs> and in this season of your life, you need to separate yourself from people who are going in the same direction as you. I know you love them. I know y'all grew up together. That's your homeboy, your stick girl. But somewhere along the line, you've got to wake up and smell the coffee and realize that this person is not helping your walk with Christ. And if they don't decide to follow God with you, you got to give them something called the gift of goodbye. I got to say goodbye to you. I got to say so long, sayonara, hasta la vista, see you later. Because you're not helping me in my growth in Christ. The dynamics of your relationship have to shift. They might not like it. They might not understand it. They might not appreciate it. But you've got to get to the point in your life where pleasing God is more important than playing with them. We used to fool around. We used to play around and joke around. But there's something deeper that I'm trying to achieve. And when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I talked like a child. I acted like a child. But the scripture says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. It matters who you have in your circle. And I can hear some of y'all now. I hear you in the back back there. Oh, well, I can't leave them. I, I can't cut them off. Oh, why, could I, why would I do that to them? Because what if God put me in their life to help them? What if, what if God has me dating him just to make him closer with God? I don't believe in evangelism dating. I just want to say that. Because if that joker's not where he's supposed to be already, well, guess what? Never mind, I'll let it go. What, 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 what? Why? I can't let him go. Because God put me there to draw him closer to him. Beloved, how can you help somebody that has more of an impact on your life than you do theirs? If you want to influence somebody, you got to be able to bind the strong man up and say, hey, listen, come and follow me as I follow Christ. Listen, when you get on the airplane, right before you take off, the flight attendant always says, in case of an emergency, <laughs> they first tell you where your exits are, but they say, in case of emergency, there may be some airbags or some air masks that's going to deploy from the ceiling to provide you with oxygen. But if you pay attention and you listen and you take your earphones out for a little bit, they always say, make sure you put your own mask on before trying to help others. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying today. You have to realize that some of you are not strong enough to hang out with certain people. If you want to grow in God, it matters who you go to brunch with. It matters who you go to dinner with. It matters who's in your DMs at 3 o'clock in the morning. It matters who you consider your sneaky link. It matters. It matters. Somebody say it matters. It matters. It matters. It matters. I'm, I'm, I'm done, y'all. Y'all done missed it already. So if you want to live your best life, you got to make sure you check your circle of friends, Dr. Marino. But then it says, it says, blessed is the person who delights himself in the law of the Lord. And on that law, they meditate day and night. Now, when the writer here mentions the law, we're not just to interpret it as a set of rules for us to obey. When the writer is saying is, if you want to obtain God's favor, don't hang out with people who are going in the same direction as you and might cause you to stumble, but instead spend the same time you would be using on foolishness and get in the word. <laughs> And I know this is old school preaching, but it still works. The word of God still works. We're not just talking about a black book made by some king named James. We're talking about the living, the breathing, the active, the potent, the powerful word of God that has come from the heart of God and the mouth of God meant to pierce your ears and meant to pierce your heart and meant to change the very trajectory of your life. 
The word of God is alive and active. And how do I know it's alive? Because no matter what season you find yourself in, you can open up that book at any time. You can click that app at any time and you will find something God has said to suit your case. If you're going through a dark time, his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your pathway. If you have the confusion in your mind, his word will bring you peace. If you're going through a low valley, his word will pick you up, turn you around and place your feet back on a firm foundation again. It's the word of God that will pull you through. Can anybody testify when you found yourself in a dark and low place? It was nothing but the word of God that pulled you through. It was nothing but the word of God that helped you. It was nothing but the word of God that gave you guidance. It was the word of God that tore you down, then built you back up again. It was nothing but the word of God. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God the grass may wither and the flowers may fade but the word of God shall stand forever get in the word get in the word get in the word get in the word I promise you it's 12 o'clock we almost done delight yourself in the law of the Lord and meditate on that law day and night now, now the word meditate is something I have to mention briefly because when uh, the world talks about meditate, when people do yoga and all those things, it means it refers to the process of clearing one's mind. The objective of meditation by the world standards is to empty your mind. But what you don't realize is an empty mind might be dangerous because it leaves room for deception and demonic influence. And you don't realize it, but you don't want to have an empty mind because here in the text, the word meditation, the writer is referring to filling your mind up with the word of God. <laughs> in scripture, the word of God is referred to as the sword of the spirit, which indicates that it is a key item needed for battle. Now, if I were in the army and preparing for war and I decided not to use the equipment that is guaranteed to help me win, you would think that I'm insane. But yet every single day, there are many of us who get out of bed, we put our clothes on, our physical clothes on, we leave the house and we go out into the world. We go out to war unequipped and unarmed. And the reason why many of you are losing some battles in your life right now is because you have not taken advantage of the sword that God has given you. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's powerful and it's available for you if you just make the decision to use it. Look at somebody and say, work the word, work the word, work the word, work the word. I've done, Donald. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, sits in the seat of scoffers or walks in the path of sinners, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And they meditate on that law day and night. And here's what I like to call a spiritual cause and effect, or what you would say reciprocity, sowing and reaping, because I told you before that your obedience is but a seed in the ground. He said, if you surround yourself with godly people and a godly community while keeping your heart and mind full of his word, he said, you shall be like a tree. Now, firstly, when you look at a tree, the imagery there is one that represents strength and power and steadfastness. But not only shall you be like a tree, but a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Now, if you go to the banks of a river or somewhere that's wooded and has a lake or a body of water next to it, you'll notice that the trees that are closest to the water are the ones who have the largest trunks and the ones who have the strongest roots. And what God is saying in your life, he is ready to provide you with divine stability. 
that because you have delighted yourself in his word and because you have checked the circle of people around you, he said, I'm ready to put my hand on your life and I'm ready to provide you with a season where you will produce so much fruit, you won't know what to do with it. This is your season where you know you've been obedient and you know you've listened to his word and you know you've obeyed his commandments and you know you follow his will. I'm telling you, the word of the Lord to you today is divine stability and much fruit will be your portion. Stand up on the, all over the, on your feet all over the house. But lift your hands in his presence. I know we could have laughed. I could have hooped. We could have shouted. When, you, know, you know I know how to do all that. But I really want you to get this. That, that, that God is saying, first, it's time for you to do a self-check. Check the circle of people that you have around you. For they indeed determine the very course of your life and how you are going. Secondly, get in the word of God. And as a preacher, I can tell you, it's, it's, it's hard to do it every day because your flesh doesn't want to read the word. I said this at eight o'clock. I said, anytime you want to get a nap or get sleepy, just open, open up a book. <laughs> and before you know it, you'll be asleep. But I'm telling you, take intentional time to read his word. For some of you, a devotional is enough. Open up that devotional, read it in the morning. But, 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 but for some of y'all, y'all been in the game a, a, a little too long. It's time to study, to show yourself approved. Because after a while, we, we, we graduate from milk and we, and, and we go to solid food. The Lord has been telling you, spend time with me. Open up that book. Read the word. I know you're busy. I'm busy. We're all busy. But God is never too busy to bless you. He's never too busy to wake you up in the morning. He's never too busy to put favor on your life. Be intentional about your time with him. Father, we thank you. We thank you now for this word and we thank you for this time. We thank you for the reminder that the only way that we can live our best lives it's not through tangible things, houses, cars, money. Those things are great. We love those things. But Father, what we really desire is to have spiritual growth and development. What we really desire is to be closer to you. Because if we're closer to you, everything that's in your hand will come. If we seek ye first the kingdom of God, thank you, Holy Spirit, and its righteousness. You said all of these things will then be added. But Father, I pray in Jesus' name that through and by the conviction and the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will remind them that it's time to seek after you. Seek you while you may be found. Call upon you while you are near. I thank you, oh God, that you are willing and ready and available. That as they read your word, that you will begin to give them divine revelation. That you would allow it to sear and to press into their hearts. And then, Father, I pray that you would give them supernatural strength to be able to check the circle of people they have around them. The ones that aren't conducive to their walk with you. I pray, oh God, that you would be uh, like a gardener now and that you would weed out those people and those things and those places and those individuals that aren't getting them to where you would have them to be. Father, I pray that you would do a dialysis around them even now. Filter out those people that might be whispering in their ears. Oh God, I thank you. I thank you that they would, they would see the benefits of it instantly once they make the decision. That they would see that their life is being made better. Thank you. That they are being enriched and that their mind is being renewed once they change their circle and get in your word. I thank you, oh God, that our best life is yet to come. We give you praise and we give you glory. It's in Jesus' name. All of God's people said amen. Only if you receive this word, put your hands together and give them some glory.